Hello. This video is about ophthalmology, and it is not intended to cover all details of this branch. It will cover the important points with some tips for the exam. According to the curriculum of the Royal College, ophthalmology include the topics that you see now. Note that some topics are already covered with other branches, so we will not talk about them here. Let's start talking about the important details of these topics and let's start with visual pathway. The visual pathway describes the anatomical pathway by which electrical signals generated by the retina are sent to the brain. The nerve fibers of the retina collect together at the optic disc before passing out of the eye through the orbital bones and into the brain via the optic nerve, which is the second cranial nerve. The optic nerves from each eye meet at the optic chiasm. At this point, the nerve fibers, which are associated with the nasal half of the retina from each eye cross over, so that on leaving the optic chiasm and passing into the optic tracts, the nerve fibers from the nasal retina of one eye travel down the optic tract with the nerve fibers originating in the temporal retina of the other eye. At the end of each optic tract, the retinal nerve fibers connect with other visual pathway nerves in a structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus located in the midbrain. Some processing of the electrical signals occurs in the lateral geniculate nucleus before a series of radiating nerve fibers, the optic radiation, convey the information to the visual cortex in the posterior portion of the occipital lobe. The lesions of the visual pathway cause different effects according to the level of the lesion. And you should know the visual effect of each lesion according to its level. Lesion of optic nerve causes ipsilateral monoocular visual loss. So, right optic nerve lesion causes right monoocular visual loss, and left optic nerve lesion causes left monoocular visual loss. Lesion at optic chiasm causes bitemporal hemanopia. This is because the lesion affects only the nerve fibers that come from the temporal region. Lesion at optic tract causes contralateral homonymous hemanopia. So, right optic tract lesion causes left homonymous hemanopia, and left optic tract lesion causes right homonymous hemanopia. Lesion at parietal upper optic radiations causes contralateral homonymous inferior quadrantanopia. So, right parietal upper optic radiations lesion causes left homonymous inferior quadrantanopia, and left parietal upper optic radiations lesion causes right homonymous inferior quadrantanopia. Lesion at temporal lower optic radiations causes contralateral homonymous superior quadrantanopia. So, right temporal lower optic radiations lesion causes left homonymous superior quadrantanopia, and left temporal lower optic radiations lesion causes right homonymous superior quadrantanopia. Lesion at occipital visual cortex causes contralateral homonymous hemanopia with macular sparing. So, Right occipital visual cortex lesion causes left homonymous hemanopia with macular sparing, and left occipital visual cortex lesion causes right homonymous hemanopia with macular sparing. These are all lesions of the visual pathway. And this table also show all the lesions. Note that before the optic chiasm, the lesions cause ipsilateral effects and after the optic chiasm the lesions cause contralateral effects. But the lesion of the optic chasm itself has no ipsilateral or contralateral descriptions, because we have only one optic chiasm. Note also that, for optic radiations, the lesion at the upper radiations, causes inferior effects. And the lesion at the lower radiations, causes superior effects. Note also that only the lesions at the visual cortex are the only lesions that are associated with macular sparing. Now, let's move to the eye reflexes. And we have two important reflexes, pupillary light reflex and corneal reflex. The pupillary light reflex is an autonomic reflex that constricts the pupils of both eyes in response to light stimulation of one eye, thereby adjusting the amount of light that reaches the retina. The afferent nerve is the optic nerve. The efferent nerve is the oculomotor nerve. Testing of the pupillary light reflex is useful to identify lesions anywhere along its pathway. 
the corneal reflex causes both eyes to blink in response to tactile stimulation of the cornea. The afferent nerve is the trigeminal nerve. The efferent nerve is the facial nerve. Testing of the corneal reflex is useful to identify lesions anywhere along its pathway. Now, let's move to eye movements. We have the following eye movement, elevation, depression, abduction, adduction, intorsion, and extortion. Elevation is done by superior rectus and inferior oblique muscles. Depression is done by inferior rectus and superior oblique muscles. Abduction is done by lateral rectus muscle. Adduction is done by medial rectus muscle. Intorsion is done by superior oblique muscle. Extortion is done by inferior oblique muscle. Note that the movements of the eye can be concluded from the names of the muscles with a small exception. This exception is that the oblique muscles do movements that are opposite to their names. So, the superior oblique causes depression, and the inferior oblique causes elevation of the eye. For the nerve supply of the eye muscles, all extraocular muscles are supplied by the oculomotor nerve except the superior oblique muscle which is supplied by the trochlear nerve, and the lateral rectus muscle which is supplied by the abducens nerve. So, there are four cranial nerves that supply the eye. These nerves are the cranial nerves 2, 3, 4, and 6. The cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve, and it is responsible for the vision and represents the afferent nerve of the pupillary light reflex. The cranial nerve 3 is the oculomotor nerve, and it is responsible for all eye movements except depression, intorsion and abduction of the eye. So, with the injury of the oculomotor nerve, the eye becomes depressed and abducted, and diplopia occurs. The oculomotor nerve also supplies the levator palpebrae superioris muscle which elevate the eyelid. So, injury to the oculomotor nerve causes ptosis too. The oculomotor nerve also represents the efferent nerve of the pupillary light reflex because it supplies the constrictor pupillary muscle. So, the injury of the oculomotor nerve causes fixed and dilated pupil with loss of accommodation and abnormal pupillary light reflex. The cranial nerve 4 is trochlear nerve, and it supplies the superior oblique muscle only. So, injury to the trochlear nerve causes weakness of depression and intorsion of the eye. The weakness of depression causes weakness of downward gaze that causes difficulty reading and walking downstairs. And the weakness of intorsion makes the eye extorted, so the patient head tilts to opposite side to compensate. The injury of the trochlear nerve also causes vertical diplopia, and it is important to remember that the diplopia of the trochlear nerve injury is vertical diplopia. The cranial nerve 6 is the abducens nerve, and the abducens nerve, from its name, is responsible for abduction of the eye because it supplies the lateral rectus muscle. So, Injury to the abducens nerve causes convergent squint at rest with inability to abduct eye. The injury of the abducens nerve also causes horizontal diplopia, and it is important to remember that the diplopia of the abducens nerve injury is horizontal diplopia. Now, let's move to the different emergencies of the eye, and let's start with acute angle closure glaucoma. Glaucoma is a serious condition that can cause irreversible loss of vision. Acute angle closure glaucoma is an ocular emergency that results from a rapid increase in intraocular pressure due to outflow obstruction of aqueous humor. Several factors lead to the obstruction in acute angle closure glaucoma, but the major predisposing factor is the structural anatomy of the anterior chamber, leading to a shallower angle between the iris and the cornea. The risk factors of acute angle closure glaucoma include advancing age. Because the size of the lens increases with age crowding the region of the anterior chamber angle. Female gender. Because women tend to have more shallow anterior chambers. Asian ethnicity. Hyperopia. And it is important also to know the precipitating factors of acute angle closure glaucoma because in the exam one of them may be mentioned and this may be the key of the answer. The precipitating factors of acute angle closure glaucoma include 
Watching television in a darkened room. Adopting a semi-prone position such as for reading. Use of adrenergic drugs such as phenylephrine. Use of antimuscarinic drugs such as tricyclic antidepressants. The clinical features include severe eye pain associated with headache, nausea, and vomiting. Unilateral sudden onset red eye. Impaired visual acuity. Lights are seen surrounded by halos. Semi dilated and fixed pupil, classically in a vertically oval shape. Corneal epithelial edema. Tender hard eyeball. Conjunctival injection. For management, refer the patient urgently to ophthalmology. Encourage patients to lie flat with their face up and head not supported by pillows. Give analgesia and antiemetics is required. There are some drugs that can be used temporarily for the treatment of acute angle closure glaucoma. The first line drugs act to suppress aqueous humor production. These include systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, such as acetazolamide 500 mg oral or IV. Topical beta blockers, such as timolol maleate. Topical alpha-2 agonists, such as apriclonidine. And there are also adjunct drugs, which include topical ophthalmic cholinergic agents such as pilocarpine, which causes pupil constriction with thinning of the iris and its pulling away from the inner eye wall and trabecular meshwork, thus opening the angle. Hyperosmotic agents, such as mannitol, which produce transient reduction in intraocular pressure. All of these measures are temporary measures. The definitive treatment is laser or surgical iridectomy. Now, let's move to inflammations of the eye, and let's start with conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is an inflammation of the conjunctiva. The clinical features include acute onset conjunctival erythema, discomfort which may be described as grittiness, foreign body, or burning sensation, watering and discharge which may cause transient blurring of vision, no significant pain, light sensitivity, or visual loss. This is in addition to other clinical features that vary according to the cause of conjunctivitis. And conjunctivitis, according to the cause, may be allergic, bacterial, or viral. Allergic conjunctivitis is usually bilateral. Itching is the prominent feature with it, and it is most commonly seasonal and often associated with atopy. Bacterial conjunctivitis is usually associated with purulent or mucopurulent discharge with eyelid matting and itching is uncommon with it. Viral conjunctivitis is usually associated with upper respiratory tract infection and preauricular lymphadenopathy, and pseudomembranes may form on tarsal conjunctival surfaces in severe cases. The management of conjunctivitis also varies according to the cause. Allergic conjunctivitis is managed by avoidance of allergens, using artificial tears and cool compresses. The drugs that can be used with allergic conjunctivitis are topical antihistamines with or without topical mast cell stabilizers. For bacterial conjunctivitis, most cases of bacterial conjunctivitis are self-limiting and resolve within 5 to 7 days without treatment. But if it is severe, topical antibiotics can be used, such as chloramphenicol drops or ointment. Also, most cases of viral conjunctivitis are self-limiting. No antivirals are needed. Only advise self-care measures such as bathing, cleaning the eyelids, cool compresses, and lubricating drops or artificial tears. Now, let's move to episcleritis and scleritis. Episcleritis is inflammation of the episcleral, which is a thin layer of tissue that lies between the conjunctiva and the sclera. Scleritis is inflammation of the sclera itself, which is the white outer wall of the eye. In episcleritis, most patients do not have an underlying systemic inflammatory or infectious disease. In scleritis, most patients have an underlying systemic inflammatory or infectious disease, and the most common association is with rheumatoid arthritis. The clinical features of episcleritis are acute onset of redness, irritation, and watering of the eye and sectoral redness in the eye. And you should remember well the term sectoral redness as a characteristic of episcleritis. The clinical features of scleritis are acute onset of severe ocular pain and redness, 
lacrimation, photophobia, visual disturbance, bluish purple discoloration of the sclera, and reduced visual acuity. Episcleritis may be differentiated from scleritis by using phenylephrine eye drops, which cause blanching of the blood vessels in episcleritis, but not in scleritis. For management of episcleritis, for patients not bothered by the presence of episcleritis, treatment is generally not needed because symptoms and findings typically resolve over several weeks. For patients bothered by the presence of episcleritis, prescribe artificial tear preparations, topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and topical steroids. In contrast, patients with scleritis need urgent referral to an ophthalmologist for treatment with steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs. For complications, the complications of episcleritis are rare, but the complications of scleritis include keratitis, scleral thinning, globe perforation, glaucoma, cataracts, retinal detachment, permanent visual loss. Now, Let's move to anterior uveritis. Anterior uveritis involves inflammation of the iris and ciliary body. Anterior uveritis can cause irreversible loss of vision. The clinical features include painful red eye, and the pain may be worse when the person is contracting the ciliary muscle such as with reading. Diminished or blurred vision. Watering of the eye. Photophobia. Small fixed irregular pupil. For management. Refer patient urgently to ophthalmology. Steroids are used to reduce inflammation and prevent adhesions in the eye. Corticosteroids may be given topically, orally, intravenously, intramuscularly, or by periocular or intraocular injection or implant. A cycloplegic midriatic drug, such as cyclopentolate or atropine, may also be given to paralyze the ciliary body. This relieves pain and prevents adhesions between the iris and lens. Infectious uveritis, bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic, is treated with an appropriate antimicrobial drug as well as corticosteroids and cycloplegics. Now, let's move to optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is inflammation of the optic nerve. By far the most common form is idiopathic which is a primary demyelinating disease occurring in isolation or as part of multiple sclerosis. The clinical features include partial or total unilateral visual loss occurring over several days, periorbital or retroocular pain exacerbated by eye movements, loss of color vision, reduced visual acuity with a scotoma affecting central vision, optic disc swelling. For diagnosis, MRI of the optic nerves is done. For management, refer patient urgently to ophthalmology. Treatment is usually with corticosteroid therapy. Now, let's move to periorbital and orbital cellulitis. Periorbital cellulitis is an infectious process occurring in the eyelid tissues superficial to the orbital septum. Orbital cellulitis is an infectious process affecting the muscles and fat within the orbit, deep to the orbital septum. So, periorbital cellulitis is superficial to the orbital septum and orbital cellulitis is deep to the orbital septum. Organisms involved include Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Streptococcus species, and anaerobes. There are clinical features that occur in both conditions which are a history of recent sinus infection or eyelid injury, redness, swelling, and tenderness of the eye fever and systemic symptoms. And there are additional clinical features that occur with orbital cellulitis only. Those are, headache, pain with eye movements, visual loss, diplopia, reduced visual acuity, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia. The first choice investigation for suspected orbital cellulitis is CT sinus and orbits with contrast. For management, empirical broad-spectrum antibiotics are used initially, then targeted therapy is used according to cultures. With periorbital cellulitis, intravenous antibiotics are used for pediatric cases and oral antibiotics are used for adult cases. Clinical improvement is usually seen within 24 to 48 hours. Prognosis is excellent, 
with full resolution in almost all cases. With orbital cellulitis, all patients should be admitted for intravenous antibiotic therapy. Prompt orbital imaging for underlying sinusitis or orbital abscess is mandatory, and patients may require surgical drainage. Now, let's move to the trauma of the eye, and let's start with corneal abrasions. For corneal abrasions, relatively minor superficial injuries can cause significant pain as the cornea is densely innervated with sensory fibers from the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. The causes of corneal abrasions include mechanical trauma, foreign bodies, chemical, radiation, or flashburns, contact lens used during insertion or removal, and recurrent erosions. The clinical features include sudden onset of eye pain on blinking, foreign body sensation, lacrimation, photophobia, decreased or blurred vision, conjunctival injection, blepharospasm, which means abnormal contraction of eyelid. For diagnosis, fluorescein examination is used. The stained abrasion appears yellow with the naked eye. For management, exclude retained foreign body. Give analgesia such as oral paracetamol. Give ocular lubricants. Prescribe topical antibiotics such as chloramphenicol. Most uncomplicated small corneal abrasions will heal rapidly within one to two days without visual impairment but refer severe or complicated cases immediately to the emergency eye service. Now, let's move to open globe injury. Signs of an open globe include a peaked pupil, shallow anterior chamber, corneal or scleral laceration, abnormal pigmented tissue pushing through the sclera or cornea, and the presence of many floating red or white blood cells seen on slit lamp examination in the aqueous humor fluid. A sidle test can locate small leaks of aqueous fluid from the anterior chamber. To perform a sidal test, anesthetize the eye, wet the fluorescein strip, and wipe the strip over the area of concern while keeping the patient from blinking. The undiluted fluorescein appears dark orange in normal light. But if a leak is present, it becomes light orange or green when viewed under blue light. Once the condition is identified, Immediately consult an ophthalmic specialist and describe the situation. Prepare the patient for surgery or transfer, because open globes are surgical emergencies that require immediate intervention in hemodynamically stable patients. Cover the affected eye with a rigid shield. Never place a pressure dressing, gauze, or other soft material under the rigid shield because the pressure may force contents out of the eye. Provide an IV antibiotic. Fluoroquinolones are the only class of antibiotics that penetrate the vitreous at therapeutic concentrations when given by an intravenous or oral route. Now, let's move to chemical burns. You should know how to manage chemical burns of the eye. Initial treatment involves copious irrigation of the affected eye. After each liter of solution, or about every 30 minutes, stop the fluid, wait for 5 to 10 minutes, and check the pH of the tears. Urine dipsticks can be used safely to measure the ocular pH. When the pH is neutral, about 7.0, you may stop irrigating the eye. Remember that alkaline solutions are usually more damaging to the eye and often require more flushing to normalize the pH. Now, let's move to orbit fractures and retrobulbar hemorrhages. We talked about this already under the maxillofacial trauma. You should remember that fractures of the orbit may cause bleeding in the muscle cone or around it. If the bleeding is significant enough, a compartment syndrome can develop that obstructs the blood supply to the optic nerve and globe. Vision loss can occur after about 1.5 hours of impaired blood supply, so immediate treatment is imperative. Signs of a retrobulbar hemorrhage with compartment syndrome include decreased vision, elevated eye pressure, asymmetrical proptosis, resistance to retropulsion, and tight eyelids. If you are concerned about compartment syndrome, immediately perform canthotomy and cantholysis. Orbital fractures can also result in the entrapment of extraocular muscles within the bony fracture site. Repair within 48 hours of onset is recommended to avoid muscle ischemia and permanent damage. Now, 
Let's move to retinal detachment. Retinal detachment refers to the separation of the inner neurosensory retina from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. Retinal detachment is a preventable cause of vision loss, as prompt recognition and referral may allow early surgical repair before the macula is detached. There are three main types of retinal detachment. The first type is the regmatogenous type, which is the most common type. In this type, as the vitreous shrinks and partly separates from the retinal surface, a retinal tear or break may develop. The second type is the exudative type. This is caused by leakage of fluid into the subretinal space, often due to inflammation or malignancy. The third type is the tractional type. This is most commonly seen in people with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where abnormal vasculature causes contraction of the vitreous which then pulls on the underlying retina. The risk factors of retinal detachment include myopia, family history or previous history of retinal break or detachment, eye trauma, previous cataract surgery, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, inflammatory conditions, congenital eye disease, malignancy. For clinical features, Retinal detachment presents with the four features that start with letter F, which are floaters, flashes, field loss, and fall in visual acuity. Floaters means the perception of mobile dots. Flashes means the perception of light often seen as recurrent brief flashes. Field loss may be described as a dark curtain or shadow which starts in the periphery and progresses towards the center. Fundoscopy findings of retinal detachment include loss of red reflex, vitreous opacities, and detached retinal folds. For management, refer patient urgently to ophthalmology. Retinal detachment may be treated with a variety of surgical techniques, which are vitrectomy, scleral buckling, and pneumatic retinopexy. Now, let's move to vascular conditions of the eye, and let's start with subconjunctival hemorrhage. Subconjunctival hemorrhage is usually asymptomatic. There may occasionally be mild discomfort or a popping sensation at onset. On examination, there is an area of localized, well demarcated hemorrhage in one eye, with a visible posterior border, in the absence of pain, no reduction of visual acuity, normal pupil reactions, and no corneal staining. Blood pressure should be measured in all patients to exclude hypertension. Reassure the patient that the condition usually clears within 5 to 10 days and cold compresses may reduce any discomfort. Now, let's move to central retinal artery occlusion. Central retinal artery occlusion presents with acute, painless loss of monocular vision. And you should know how to differentiate between painful and painless loss of vision. Painless loss of vision is caused mainly by vascular eye conditions. So, central retinal artery occlusion causes painless loss of vision. The causes of central retinal artery occlusion include carotid artery atherosclerosis, which is the most common cause, cardiogenic embolism, small artery disease, hematological diseases, inflammatory disease. Fundoscopy findings of central retinal artery occlusion are ischemic retinal whitening and cherry red spot at the macula. Central retinal artery occlusion has a poor prognosis for spontaneous recovery of vision. Efforts to restore vision should begin emergently, as irreversible retinal injury occurs within 100 minutes of arterial occlusion. Standard treatments include digital orbital massage to fluctuate intraocular pressure and manually dislodge the clot, intravenous acetazolamide, intravenous mannitol, or topical pressure lowering drops such as timolol to decrease intraocular pressure. Vasodilator medications such as sublingual isosorbide dinitrate to increase ocular blood flow. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy to maintain oxygenation of the retina pending reperfusion. Intra-arterial thrombolytic therapy. Surgical revascularization techniques. However, no treatments currently available have been proven to improve visual outcomes. Now, let's move to retinal vein occlusion. Obstruction of the retinal venous system by thrombus causes increased venous pressure, 
and this can cause venous tortuosity, intraretinal hemorrhage, and edema in the affected region of the retina. The presentation is sudden painless loss of vision. Fundoscopy findings of retinal vein occlusion include venous tortuosity and dilatation, intraretinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, optic disc edema, stormy sunset appearance. Patients should be referred to an ophthalmologist within 24 hours. Now, let's move to vitreous hemorrhage. Vitreous hemorrhage is the extravasation of blood into one of the several potential spaces formed within and around the vitreous body. The causes of vitreous hemorrhage include diabetic retinopathy, neovascularization from branch or central retinal vein occlusion, sickle cell retinopathy, retinal tear or detachment, posterior vitreous detachment, trauma, macroaneurysm, age-related macular degeneration. The clinical features of vitreous hemorrhage depend on the severity of the hemorrhage. Early mild hemorrhage causes new floaters. Moderate hemorrhage causes dark streaks. Dense hemorrhage causes fall in visual acuity. For management, refer patient urgently to ophthalmology. Treatment is directed at the underlying cause. The last topic in this video is a pediatric topic. It is ophthalmia neonatorum. Ophthalmia neonatorum refers to any conjunctivitis occurring within the first 28 days of life. It is often due to a blocked lacrimal duct but may also be caused by a variety of bacterial and viral pathogens. So, the main cause is blocked lacrimal duct. The most common bacterial causes are Chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. And Chlamydia trachomatis is more common than gonorrhea. The most common viral cause is herpes simplex. The two major causes of infective neonatal conjunctivitis which should be excluded as a priority are chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. An extremely purulent discharge in the first few days of life should prompt consideration of Neisseria gonorrhea. The time of onset of presentation varies with the likely cause. Non-infectious ophthalmia neonatorum presents within the first 24 hours and it is usually self-limiting. Ophthalmia neonatorum caused by Neisseria gonorrhea presents from birth to five days post-birth. Ophthalmia neonatorum caused by Chlamydia trachomatis presents from five days to 14 days post-birth. Ophthalmia neonatorum caused by herpes simplex virus presents from one to two weeks post-birth. For management. If there is no conjunctival inflammation or other signs of infection then no antibiotics are required. Advise regular cleansing of the affected eye with sterile water or saline. Wiping from nose to outer aspect of the eye in a single motion. This should be done 4 to 6 hourly for 2 to 3 days. If discharge persists for greater than 48 hours delayed antibiotic prescription may be indicated. A swab must be taken prior to the commencement of any antibiotic treatment. Common organisms should respond to topical chloramphenicol, and both eyes should be treated. So, empiric treatment with topical chloramphenicol eye ointment should be commenced pending culture. If Neisseria gonorrhea is the cause, use sphotaxime 100 mg per kilogram single dose IV. If the cause is chlamydia trachomatis, Use oral erythromycin 12.5 mg per kilogram, dose 4 times daily for 14 days or oral azithromycin 20 mg per kilogram once daily for 3 days.